For this procedure, you will need five rescuers. Remember the phrase, five to tie, or don't even try. Once the decision to restrain has been made, make every effort to apply the restraints prior to transport. If a patient takedown is necessary, it should only be conducted by law enforcement unless your agency is willing to commit to receiving the same level and amount of comprehensive and ongoing training that law enforcement officers receive in restraint and use of force. Have your equipment ready and the stretcher close by in its lowest position with the brakes on and the handrails lowered. Whenever possible, to make the physical restraint procedure safer for you and the patient, physical restraint should be accompanied by chemical restraint beforehand. This is especially important in cases of suspected excited delirium. Because this is a team approach to physical restraint, each member is assigned a very specific and limited role based upon the extremity for which they are responsible. The provider at the patient's head will grasp the head with both hands and brace their forearms against the end of the stretcher. His job is to prevent the patient from biting others while constantly assessing the patient's airway and mental status. This rescuer will not let go of the head until all four extremities are securely anchored to the stretcher using soft restraints. Some services even recommend that this rescuer wear puncture-resistant leather gloves. The rescuer at the patient's right arm holds the arm up above the patient's head with the elbow fully bent, being careful not to exceed the shoulder's normal range of motion. Her hands are just above and below the patient's elbow. The provider at the patient's left arm will hold the extremity fully extended along the patient's side firmly pressing downward and inward into the padded mattress. Note the method used to maintain control of the patient's left arm. Rather than holding the patient's wrist, he grasps the medial aspect of the patient's hand. And by rotating the patient's hand inward, the provider achieves superior control. Placing his leg across the patient's pelvis, the provider is also able to control the patient's hips. At no time should any weight be placed upon the patient's chest, stomach, or back, as doing so can impede the patient's ability to breathe. The two providers holding the patient's legs apply firm downward pressure with their hands just above and below the knee, keeping their arms straight as they lean forward at the hips and use their body weight to keep the patient from moving his legs. In this manner, Rather than having to match strength with the patient, they are able to use their own body weight and good technique to prevent the legs from moving. The provider holding the patient's left leg will quickly and carefully straddle and sit across the patient's thighs just above the knees while facing toward the foot end of the stretcher. Once in position, he can raise both handrails and fasten a seat belt across the patient's thighs again just above the knees. The provider holding the patient's right leg is now free to apply the soft restraints in a clockwise fashion beginning with the patient's right wrist to left wrist, left ankle, and finally the right ankle. Restraint straps should be anchored to the stretcher's upper frame. For superior anchoring strength and stability, secure each restraint device to a T-joint on the upper frame. Avoid anchoring to any adjustable part such as the handrails. Whatever anchor points you choose, the result must be that the extremity is kept fully extended, with the exception of the right elbow, which remains bent above the patient's head. Providers should use care not to manipulate any joint beyond its normal, safe range of motion. When anchoring the device to the stretcher's frame, avoid tying knots. Use of quick-release knots is not recommended for use in behavioral restraint. Even after your assigned extremity has been restrained, do not let go until all extremities have been restrained. Upon full restraint, the team members will double-check the status of their co-members' restraints
to ensure that they are effectively secured to the patient and appropriately anchored. Remember that after all restraints have been applied, no extremity should be able to move, period. If any of the patient's limbs are able to move, you have not restrained the patient adequately. Next, providers assess and record distal motor, sensory, and circulatory function in all four extremities, as well as all respiratory status indicators. Use of capnography is strongly encouraged. Because seatbelt positioning is absolutely critical to full and effective restraint, all seatbelts should be installed in their proper locations along the length of the stretcher. Consider installing the short end of the belt to position the buckle away from the patient's downward restrained hand. One belt should lay across the patient's thighs just above, not below, the patient's knees. Another should prevent lateral shifting and rotation of the hips and any belt that crosses the chest must not impede chest expansion. Once secured, the patient should be transported supine with his head elevated at least 30 degrees to reduce the risk of aspiration and promote ease of breathing. Avoid using the prone position at all times. When you restrain someone, do not neglect the fact that you have taken away his freedom, his ability to protect himself, as of that moment, you have assumed a fiduciary responsibility to ensure his well-being. At all times, you must maintain direct visualization of all four extremities and all four restraints. Seated in a location that allows you to effectively monitor for respiratory and other complications.